Hello, and welcome back to the Brave Traveler podcast. We're fans of the supernatural, tales of fantasy and adventure. I'm your host, Dave Murray, and the author of Majesty, the Sorcerer, and the Saint. I think I mentioned that Majesty started out as a request for a bedtime story from my two boys. As a writer, I took the challenge seriously and told them if they went to sleep, I would think of something really great. Note to parents, that only works for two or three nights. After that, they get like angry villagers with pitchforks, you know. Where's the story? No story, no peace. (laughs) Fortunately, I had what my old English teacher used to call a germ of an idea. The next four nights, I told them a story that had everything. Wizards, magic, fairies, goblins, ogres, angels and demons. They were riveted. Granted, they were only seven and four and were happy to just be up past bedtime. Still, that was my spark of inspiration. Uh, Later, I'll tell you one of my son's contributions to the story that was pretty amazing. And uh, I'll also tell you some responses to the book you won't believe. Anyway, once again, if you like this content, please do all the fun things people who like fun things are known to do. Hug a friend, get an ice cream, subscribe, comment, hit the like button. All right, with that, let's get back to the story. Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint. Episode 3, Chapter 2. What's so big about magic? Katie's room was nicely decorated and brightly colored. There were dolls and cute stuffed animals on her bed and on either side of her dresser and bedside table. It was all very neat and pleasant. With the exception of the invisible seven-foot angel standing in the middle of her room, radiating light like the sun. The angel floated off the ground and took up so much space, his head scraped the ceiling while his wings were open wide and barely fit inside her room. His silver eyes were aglow, as was his entire body. This angelic being with his perfect features and tall frame was lovely to look at. But if Katie could have seen this warrior of God draped in white robes smiling down on her, she would have been absolutely startled out of her wits. The fact that he was a protector of the innocent, sent by God to keep her far from evil, would have brought little comfort especially with a host of imps, urchins, and a hook-nosed goblin living in the room just down the hall. Katie took her seat by the window, and the angel turned to watch her, his wings casting silvery sparks as they swept through the walls, and he gazed down upon the child. He could feel her emotions stirring. The strange goings-on at the dinner table had left Katie feeling unsettled and out of sorts, and the more she thought about it, the more it disturbed her. Then there was her brother, who was acting stranger than usual, and this upset her as well. She had to admit she was having a lot of thoughts lately that were upsetting, then remembered something her nana used to say. When trouble starts to come your way, wait to worry and start to pray. Wait to worry and start to pray. More pearls of wisdom, Katie whispered, then climbed down off the window seat and got down on her knees. She folded her hands and bowed her head, then closed her eyes. The towering angel knelt down beside her and folded his giant wings. The only official prayer Katie knew was the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. Aside from that, she usually just talked to God and told Him what was on her mind. Katie had to think a moment and when she was ready, she spoke softly, with a tenderness in her voice that was both sweet and respectful. It was a simple prayer from the heart of a child that made the angel smile. Then, with a polite amen, she hopped to her feet. Katie tended to keep her prayer short and to the point, since she figured that God was busy and had far more important things to do. Still, she was so confident in the power of prayer She simply had to go see if Jack was any different. The angel rose quickly to get out of her way and watched her march to the door. When she reached Jack's room, she peeked inside. It was darker than usual. Her first thought was, 
Maybe I should have prayed for Jack's room instead. Katie knocked and wished she hadn't. It was a weak little knock that tried not to attract attention to itself. Across the room, she could see Jack hunched over his large play table that was shoved in the corner. The boy glanced over his shoulder, then turned back around, which was the usual greeting. She wouldn't have minded a bit if Jack had actually gotten up and helped her across the room, but knew that was far too much to hope for. The room was watching her, and she could feel it. She stiffened slightly and tried to find the courage to tell the room to go mind its own business, but it was hard enough just walking across the darkened floor, littered with clothes and other things she could hardly make out. The ugly goblin glared down at her from on top of Jack's bookshelf. Katie could feel his icy gaze as she passed by and looked around her. The moment she took her eyes off the floor, she tripped and stumbled, then paused to see where she was going. When she did, the devilish imps slowly crept out of the dark to surround her like a pack of invisible wolves. They gloated with hungry eyes and licked their pointy horns with long black tongues that curled out of their mouths like shiny ribbons. Red claws clicked and glinted in the dark as they threatened to devour her delicious innocence. The fiendish creatures were still churning with hideous delight and wicked pleasure when the huge angel walked in behind Katie and filled the room with his light. The blinding light with its angelic power was the last thing the little monsters ever expected to see in Jack's room. With a shriek and a howl, evil scattered in every direction, like cold water splashing out of a hot pan. It jumped into books and ducked inside boxes. Imps and urchins darted back and forth, bumping into each other, then dove through the walls like terrified shadows. The light hit Numlock so hard it knocked him off his perch atop the bookshelf and sent him crashing to the floor. One look at the guardian, and the goblin scrambled to his feet as quick as he could, then lunged head first and slid under a pile of clothes where he waited and trembled. The evil creatures made lots of noise, fleeing for cover in their frightful attempt to escape, but none of it, not one bit, made the slightest sound to the human ear, not a peep. Nor did Katie or Jack see the radiant light of the angel. The room was just as dark as ever. But with evil in hiding and the invisible angel towering over her, Katie felt much better. She crossed the room and came up behind Jack. In front of him was what used to be his train set. Now a medieval landscape took up the entire surface of the table, miniature and perfect to the slightest detail. There were hills with miniature trees and bushes, and a little stone castle wonderfully constructed in the middle of it all. Below it was a stream of real water that flowed under a narrow stone bridge that Jack had made. The pump was well hidden, and the water streamed around tiny rocks that looked like boulders next to the castle. In the dim blue light of his desk lamp that shone like a silvery moon, it all looked quite real. The castle was called Bathenoir, a name Jack had found in a book. Bathenoir meant refuge, which seemed to fit, since he spent so much of his time sitting there, dreaming about magic and fighting magic battles. Below the stone bridge was the Black Knight, with grim mace held high. He was trapped by a dragon perched on a ledge just above. The monstrous beast was poised, reared back on its hind legs with wings spread apart and huge jaws gaping wide. The Black Knight's armor would offer little protection. One blast of the dragon's fiery breath and the dark warrior would be reduced to ashes. Katie peered over Jack's shoulder with some interest, but all she saw were toys. The knight was a little plastic figure painted black. The dragon was twelve inches long made of rubber with cloth wings. Katie watched as Jack reached across ever so slowly and moved a little bronze figure into position behind the dragon. The bronze figure was that of a tiny wizard that was no bigger than a chess piece and finely polished. Then, with his thumb and forefinger, he grasped it 
and prepared to make his move when Katie asked, What are you doing? Jack cringed. The question affected him as always, like fingernails on a chalkboard. He paused and spoke slowly, never looking away from his toys. I'm about to cast a spell, he whispered. Katie just stared. By the looks of things, her prayers had not been answered, but since she had already come this far and managed to brave the cruel darkness of Jack's room, she decided she might as well see what she could do on her own. So what's so big about magic? None of it's real, you know, Katie said. Jack winced again and tried to speak as calmly as he knew how. Why don't you just go back to your room? Okay, kid? He said smugly, just to show her who was boss. And there's no such thing as wizards either, Katie added. Jack finally turned on her and glared. What do you know? You're just a girl, Jack said, jeering at her. Katie shrugged, determined to make her point. I know that wizards and dragons don't even exist, and magic isn't real. It's all just a bunch of phony tricks, she said, sounding very sure of herself. Oh, yeah? And I suppose that God and his cutesy little angels are... All that stuff you read in the Bible is supposed to be real, huh? Of course. Everybody knows that. Jack rubbed his hand across his face. That's it, he said, then grabbed his sister by the arm. He walked across the room with Katie stumbling and bumbling along behind him, and when they had reached the hall he placed her outside, then slammed the door in her face and locked it. Thinking that was that, Jack turned around and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with a supernatural being that could have easily flattened his house without so much as a thought. The seven-foot angel that he had referred to as Cutesy. The glowing guardian glared down at Jack with fiery eyes that had seen the defeat of the Persian army and the fall of the Roman Empire. He sneered at the boy's rude behavior, then looked away and stormed out of the room, taking his light with him. As soon as the angel was gone, Numlock crept out from under the pile of clothes to see if the coast was clear. Jack had already gone back to his table. When the rest of the devilish creatures slowly came out of hiding, they looked around rather sheepishly at first, then began to elbow each other and nod their approval as one of the creatures came forward. He did it! He sent it away! This one will do well in our world! The devilish minion and urchins clapped and cheered for the human boy, but Numlock remained unimpressed and his eyes turned cold. This one will never survive in our world. It is the child of God they want. This boy is only human, the goblin sneered. Outside of Jack's room was a sign on his door that read, Keep Out. Another sign, scribbled in red marker, was exactly the perfect height for Katie to read, and shouted its message loud and clear, No Babies Allowed. Katie just pouted at it. Katie, are you all right? Mom called up from downstairs. Yeah, Mom. I'm okay, Katie said with a sigh. This was not the first time she'd found herself in the hallway outside of Jack's room, standing there, thinking. Her prayers had not worked out the way she wanted them to. Then it came to her, a thought that was more of a question, and standing there in the hallway it was begging to be answered. What does Jack like more than anything in the whole world? That's easy, she told herself. He likes magic. She remembered how Jack would go on and on, whether she wanted to hear it or not, about every mythical creature imaginable. He talked about fairies that could see into your heart. He talked about dwarves that could build anything as fast as you could think of it, or ogres that were too stupid to build anything at all. He said that ogres were mean and big as bulls, that they carried tree-stump clubs, rusted axes, and wandered through the woods without enough sense to get out of the rain. You'd be mean too if you were that stupid, was Jack's conclusion. 
Her next thought was directed to herself. What do I like as much as Jack likes magic? It was a good question, and the answer came to her as quick as a flash. I like God. She didn't know as much about God as Jack knew about magic, but that was okay. The thought of God and his angels made her just as happy. And that's when it occurred to her. Jack wasn't happy at all, not in her opinion. She couldn't even remember the last time she saw him smile. Perhaps that was the answer. Jack knew everything about magic, but as far as she could tell, it didn't make him happy. In fact, lately he was looking pale and sick with worry. The more she thought about it, the more obvious it became. If Jack was going to get better, something had to be done. Katie looked up at her brother's door with her invisible angel standing behind her, taking up a ridiculous amount of space in the hallway. God is more important than magic, you'll see, she declared, then turned and plodded back to her room with the idea that somehow she would make Jack understand whatever it took. By the time she climbed into bed, she was feeling much better about everything, and with her head nestled on her pillow, she closed her eyes and promptly went to sleep. The angel stood at the center of her room once more. His presence made it a stronghold, a pillar of strength against evil, and the boundaries had been set in place. Even Jack had only been able to get as far as the door and no further. Still, Katie's words had issued a challenge that would lead her into danger, and as her guardian, the angel knew he could only do so much to protect her, for he had no authority over free will and in such matters could not interfere. Standing there, he could feel the powers of darkness growing beyond the walls, and even in the world around him. The angel looked down on the child, for now she was safe in her room. Then with one last glance around him, the guardian disappeared into a speck of light and was gone. Chapter 3 The Chase by nine o'clock Saturday morning, the family was packed in their little gold van and on their way. They drove through quiet neighborhoods where people mowed their lawns, trimmed the hedges, and read their papers on shaded porches. Along the way, a baby pointed from its stroller, while a dog barked and ran circles in its yard, and a curious flock of birds gathered overhead attracted by the supernatural being that was gliding just above the treetops. Aside from that, the guardian angel went completely unnoticed as he followed the van below him. Soon they were driving along narrow roads, winding through the hills of Summerport. The ride through the countryside was relatively peaceful, all except for Jack's grumblings, which were typical for any ride that lasted longer than ten minutes and involved having to sit next to his sister, who, at the moment, happened to be staring at him as though he were on a shelf in a museum. "'What's the matter with you?' Jack said, obviously annoyed. Katie just smiled and wondered when she should tell Jack about God. But, judging by the look on his face, she could tell that now was not the time. Jack's anger continued to prowl around inside of him, and the presence of the angel above only made matters worse. An hour later, they arrived at the campgrounds, early enough to find a perfect spot overlooking the bay. Dad spread their blanket in the shade of a big oak tree, while Katie unpacked the picnic basket. When all was done, and Mom and the baby were settled, he put Katie's kite together. Hardly able to control herself, she watched as he showed her how to hold the control handles and use the guidelines to make it do tricks. Then. Just like that, he handed it over. Okay now, wait for the wind, he said. With a gust and a pull of the string, Katie watched in amazement as the kite leapt into the air, winding its way upward as though it suddenly had a life of its own. That's it, Pumpkin. You're doing great. <laughs> You're on your own. Sure you can handle it? Uh-huh, Katie said, gazing up at the kite trying to control it with a jerk of her shoulder and her tongue curled at the side of her mouth. 
Jack, however, was not as impressed. He followed Dad with his head down and hands jammed in his pockets as they headed to the paddle boats. Meanwhile, Mom chose a quiet moment to settle into her lawn chair and read a book in the shade of the tree. After a while, she looked over at Sophie, who was sitting on the blanket surrounded by toys and staring up with the most peculiar expression. The infant watched the man, who stood just beyond the blanket, glistening like a shiny new coin, draped in white robes with his giant wings folded against his back. The angel stood there, quietly watching Katie as the kite soared high above and seemed perfectly content right where he was, until the baby pointed at him and yelled, Tapa! Mom looked up at the invisible angel standing right in front of her and smiled up at the sky. Yes, sweetheart, kite, she said with a pleasant smile and went back to her book. The angel looked at the woman and the infant, then glanced around. There were other babies on other picnic blankets, staring and pointing. There was even a cocker spaniel, yapping noisily. But the dog fell silent and shied away when the guardian spread his enormous wings and rose silently into the sky, higher and higher, until he was so far above the park he was little more than a speck. From there he could watch Katie just as well and not attract any attention. Dozens of kites sailed above the windy hilltop. Some were larger and went higher. Some had long fancy tails that twirled like windmills, while others looked like caterpillars dancing on the air. But none of them were as colorful as Katie's and could do fancy tricks. She didn't mind showing off a little and even made her kite fly sideways, which impressed others nearby. Whoa! They were sure Katie was some kind of expert, that is, until she pointed her kite straight down, pulled back as hard as she could, and plowed the nose of the kite straight into the ground like a dart. Time for a break. She dropped the control handles and walked away with her head held high, as though she had meant to do it. When Dad returned with Jack, it was time to eat, and there was plenty of food. There was chicken and salad, fries and burgers, but even with a full stomach on a beautiful sunny day, Jack could think of nothing else but the traveling spell that wouldn't work. Can we go home now? he whined. Nope, Dad said, and pat the boy on the back as though it were a good try, then handed him dessert. Mom's cherry cheesecake with strawberries and whipped cream swirled on top. Even Jack couldn't resist that. After lunch, Dad rubbed his hands together and grinned. How about we do some fishing? he said with a wink and grabbed the poles. Jack gave a weak smile as though it were absolutely the last thing he wanted to do. With the sun high in the sky and another slice of dessert, Katie laid down for a nap and fell asleep next to the baby. When she awoke, hours had passed, and the setting sun peeked through the tall, shady pines across the lake. She sat up, rubbing her eyes, and Mom looked up from her book. I was beginning to think we were going to have to carry you to the car, she said. Katie looked around to see other families leaving as well. Time to go already? she asked, and took a nice long stretch. Mom placed a bookmark in the page where she was. Come on, help me clean up, she said, and started clearing off the blanket. Katie grabbed a few things and happened to notice the title of the book and said it slowly. The Exploration of Revelation. Mom glanced down at the book that was between them. Oh, it's one of Nana's old books. I found it in the attic, she said. What's it about? Katie asked. Well... She paused. It seemed to be a tough question. It's all about the last book in the Bible, called Revelation. What does it say? Well, it says a lot of things, like it talks about Christ and his return. He's called the king, and um, it says he rides a beautiful white horse. 
Mom mentioned other bits of information that were interesting as she gathered the baby and the toys around her, but it was the image of the white horse that stuck with Katie. She smiled to herself as she tried to picture the animal and wanted to know more about the story, but the park was closing. Jack was grumpier than ever, and it was time to go. Ten minutes later they had piled everything back into the van, picnic basket, chairs and all, and were headed home. Katie gazed out the window as they left the park behind and thought about what her mom had said. Mostly she thought about the white horse, and when she closed her eyes she could almost see it in her mind, glistening in golden rays of sunlight. What an amazing animal! Certainly the most beautiful creature anywhere in the whole universe, if it really existed, she thought to herself. A moment later, another thought occurred to her that made her smile. I wonder where the white horse is right now. I bet it's guarded by angels in heaven. The white horse and the wonders of heaven. Too bad Jack couldn't think about things like that. Katie smiled at the vision then happened to open her eyes, and stared in sheer amazement. One second later she would have missed it. Across the way, in a wide-open pasture, was a white horse, as grand and wonderful as anything Katie could imagine. Stop! Stop! Katie yelled so loud, Dad pulled over and slammed on the brakes, which woke her brother who had drifted off in the back seat. Katie wasted no time and scrambled out of the car with her mother close behind. What is it? What, what happened? Jack rubbed his eyes, trying to sit up. When he saw it was only a horse and not something really interesting like a dragon or an ogre, he grumbled and went back to sleep. Katie and her mom crossed the quiet country road and went right up to the big white fence that surrounded the pasture. They stayed perfectly still as the wind rustled through the trees and the tall grass around them. The horse stood at a distance, grazing with its long white mane gently flowing. The animal was graceful, and at the same time filled with power. Katie held on to her mom's arm as she watched the white horse and giggled with excitement. When she did, the animal looked up. It looked right at them, and Katie held her breath. The horse took a few curious steps in their direction. For a moment, it seemed that it might actually come all the way up to them. It paused gleaming in the golden sunlight, then turned and bolted away, its hooves thundering across the field. When it finally disappeared over the hillside, Katie clapped. She yelped for joy, then hugged her mother. I saw him, Mom! We saw him! That was great! Mom smiled and laughed and enjoyed the excitement, then looked down at Katie seriously for a moment. Honey, you do know that's not the horse from the story, right? Katie smiled and felt a little silly. I know, she said, and had to remind herself that it really wasn't. It had all happened so quickly. First the story about a white horse, and then to actually see one. Mom had to admit it was quite a coincidence. When they returned to the car, Katie peered out the window. What do you think his name is? she said. Who? Dad asked. The white horse, Katie replied eagerly. Dad thought aloud as he started the van. Oh, I don't know. Lightning? Trigger? Katie stared out the window as the van pulled off. No, that sounds too made up, she said. Dad frowned and decided to keep his opinions to himself as he turned his attention back to the road. Katie looked behind them, hoping to get one last glimpse of the white horse. I think I'll call him Snowball, she said. Dad glanced at Katie in the mirror, then looked at Mom with a smirk. Snowball, he whispered. Good name for a rabbit. Bye, Snowball, Katie said, as they drove away, and the big green pasture disappeared among the trees. The experience had been nothing less than enchanting. The picnic was everything Katie expected, and the surprise of the white horse was a gift she would never forget. Jack, on the other hand, was miserable and hadn't gotten much sleep since Katie wouldn't stop talking about the horse for the entire ride home. It was dark when they pulled into the driveway. Katie got the baby 
as Mom and Dad unpacked the car. And while everyone else was busy helping, Jack climbed out of the van and marched into the house like a grumpy old man who couldn't be bothered. The angels stood at the door and watched the boy as he slumped past. After dinner, Jack still wore a frown, and the fact that Katie was in a good mood didn't help matters at all. When it was time for bed, she was still beaming a smile and should have known better, but couldn't help herself. She skipped down the hall to Jack's room, threw the door wide open, and went straight inside. Numlock and the little winged creatures dove for cover as the child with her golden glow went straight to Jack who was seated at his table, pretending not to notice her, until she rushed up behind him and gave him a big hug. Hey, what's the matter with you? he shouted, then pushed her away and jumped to his feet. When he turned around, Katie was standing there, beaming a smile in her fleecy flannel nightgown and pink bunny slippers. I just came to say good night, Katie said cheerfully. Look, kid, just because you saw some stupid horse doesn't mean you can get all mushy on me, he said, doing his best to be mean and utterly pig-headed. Wasn't he wonderful? Katie said, staring off dreamily. It was like God just put him there, in the perfect place, just so we could see him. What do you mean, we? Jack said, and turned his back on her. The castle Bathenoir and its stone bridge lay in front of him, and Jack was in the middle of another game. If you think I care about some stupid horse, you're cracked, he said. Jack placed the bronze wizard under the stone bridge gently and muttered to himself as he settled back into his chair and considered the dragon's next move. The monster would surely follow him into the dark, and when he did, Katie peeked over Jack's shoulder and tried to be polite. What's the matter? Didn't you? Jack rounded on her with fists clenched and eyes glaring. Can't you see I'm trying to do something here? I saw your dumb horse, okay, and I don't care. I don't care about your stupid fairy tales or your baby stories. None of it matters to me. Now quit bothering me, all right? When Katie opened her mouth to speak, Jack yelled even louder. Did you hear me? I said, go away! He turned and pretended she was gone, just to make it perfectly clear. Katie hung her head and walked away. Just ahead of her, standing in the doorway, was the seven-foot angel, shining like the headlight of a freight train and glaring straight at Jack. This was the second time the angel had witnessed the boy's ill-mannered behavior. Katie paused and stood in front of her invisible guardian. Tomorrow's church, she reminded Jack, but the boy just stayed hunched over the table with his back to her. Good night, Katie said with a whimper. Again, there was no response. But before Katie could leave, Dad came storming into the room and walked right through the angel, which parted like a vapor. He pushed his way past Katie and went straight for Jack. Dad had heard everything from downstairs, and after Jack's rude behavior and selfish attitude all day long, the boy was in big, big trouble. Katie turned away and sulked back to her room with the angel close behind while Dad's voice echoed down the hall as he yelled at Jack and scolded him for being so mean. When Katie climbed into bed, the angel took its position in the middle of the room while Katie stared at the ceiling and listened. Jack was really getting an earful now, and she could hear him pleading. But, but she, but she was... From the sound of things, he wasn't making a very good case. After a while, it got quiet and Katie listened for any sound at all. A moment later there was a knock at the door. She sat up, surprised to see Dad standing in the doorway. Katie, Jack's got something he'd like to say to you, he said with a stern voice, then reached over and pulled Jack into view. He held the boy by the back of his collar, which made Jack look like a stiff-necked puppet. He looked at Katie with a nasty scowl on his face and his lips drawn tight. As Katie watched, his mouth twitched and wiggled as though something was struggling to get out. Then, sorry, he said, and winced like the word had thorns. Dad released him 
and Jack walked away, grumbling and filled with resentment. Then, all at once, Dad lowered his head and sighed. He looked tired and worn. This wasn't the way I wanted the day to end, he said. Katie forced a smile. It's all right. I'm okay. Dad leaned into the room a little. I love you, Pumpkin. Sweet dreams, he whispered, and blew her a kiss. When he went to close the door, he remembered that Katie liked it open, then pushed it halfway, smiled once more, and left. The hallway light went out, and Katie laid back in bed. The angel could feel her sadness, but knew there was no excuse for the boy's bad behavior. With Katie safely tucked in, he took one last look around the room, smiled at the little child of God, then vanished in the moonlight. As usual, Katie said her prayers. She prayed for her mom and dad, she prayed for her little sister, but most of all, she prayed for Jack. Like all her prayers, it was short and sweet. She prayed that God would not be angry with Jack and that he would help her brother to forget about magic. She felt like she was praying for a miracle and had no earthly idea that she was about to get one. With that, Katie rolled over and snuggled her cheek against the pillow, and just before she closed her eyes, she happened to glance at the door. When she did, she smiled. The door reminded her of the silly words Jack had said over and over again when he had tried to cast his spell. She remembered the words because they made such a funny rhyme. In fact, it sounded so silly she couldn't resist, and said the words softly so that they barely whispered from her lips. Digga who? Bigga who? Bella? Bugia? She smirked at the ridiculous sounding words, and doubted they were even words at all. Then, in the perfect stillness, she looked at her bedroom door, which was halfway open, exactly the way her dad had left it. In the dark, the door was pointed straight at her and had become a thin line, so that all she could see was the edge of the door and the knobs on either side. When she moved her head one way, she could begin to see more of the front. When she moved her head the other way, she could see more of the back. Katie decided to play a little game and see if she could look at the door so neither the front or the back was visible, which would make the edge look the thinnest. With her head on the pillow, she moved ever so slightly until it looked the thinnest it possibly could. And just when she thought she must be looking right at the precise and exact edge of her door, there was an instant flash, like a burst of sunlight that filled the room for a split second and was gone. Katie sprang up in bed and sat there in the darkness, staring and blinking. She held her breath and rubbed her eyes and tried to stay perfectly still, wondering what had happened and where the flash of light had come from. Perhaps a car had gone by, or maybe lightning. No, she thought. She had seen headlights pass across her ceiling. She had seen lightning light up her room. This was neither of those things. Katie sat there in the dark, trembling, waiting for her heart to stop racing and tried to calm down. After a while, she convinced herself that she had imagined whatever it was. The only problem was the flash of light had left the faint image of a line dancing in her eyes and she could still see it. As Katie stared into the empty space in front of her, it was that faint sliver of light that reminded her of the strange words Jack recited, the words that accompanied the traveling spell. Set ye door at the Norworld's sliver of a splinter's eye to ye dwelling place, then rest ye brow at the spot. Although Katie couldn't remember them exactly, whether she knew it or not, she could not have performed the spell any better if she tried. Set ye door at ye dwelling place meant you were to point the edge of your door to the place where you slept. That's exactly what Katie's dad had done when he left the room. Rest ye brow at the spot simply meant to lie down. Of a splinter's eye was the hard part. 
That meant you had to look at the door just the right way and find the exact spot where the other world would open up after you said the magic words. And that is precisely what Katie had done by accident. Katie wondered if she might be dreaming. But it was the flash of light that had caused her to sit up in bed, and here she was sitting up. When she had calmed down, she half suspected that the light had come from the edge of the door itself. After all, it was in the shape of a long, thin line, and that had to be more than coincidence. Katie took a deep breath, and when her heart wasn't pounding quite so hard anymore, she decided to lie back down. She placed her head on the pillow, feeling more awake than ever as she tried to find the edge of the door again. She moved, this way and that, and felt a little silly when nothing happened. She looked right at the door and studied its shape just like she had when she first lay down. She moved just a little. Nothing. She moved again. The line of the door got thinner, but still nothing. She moved ever so slightly, what seemed like the smallest fraction of the tiniest part of an inch. The flash of light was blinding, but this time Katie didn't move. She held stone still, squinting at the silvery light that once was the edge of her door. It beamed brightly, but cast no light in the room at all. With the rest of her bedroom covered in darkness, it was like looking through a narrow slit in a wall on a bright sunny day. Set ye door at the Nor world's sliver. Was this a sliver of the Nor world she was seeing, and where on earth was that? Katie stared at the thing, wanting to get closer, wanting to sit up, but she dared not move, for fear the light would disappear again. She watched the thread of light beaming in the darkness and after a short while her neck grew tired and she had to move. She shifted very slightly, but instead of going out, the light shone bright and steady. Katie moved very slowly as she sat up, then pulled the covers back and climbed out of bed, never taking her eyes off the light. She patted the floor with her feet till she found her slippers. When she was ready, she started forward to get a better look, fully expecting the light to disappear at any moment. But the closer she got, the more she thought she could make something out. With a few more steps, she could actually begin to see into the narrow space of light and knew that what she had suspected was true. This was more than a light. It was indeed a thin sliver of a door to something or somewhere. Katie stared right at it as hard as she could, and although she could only see a tiny slice, she suddenly knew what it was she was looking at. What's more, she knew where it was. Katie tried to stay calm as she drew closer, longing to get a better look. She crept forward with her arms outstretched, teetering like a tightrope walker on a string. The closer she got, the more she feared it would all disappear. Instead, the opening seemed to grow wider as her curiosity drew her forward and she stared in wonder. When she finally crossed the dark floor, Katie was bathed in light. She could hear the faint sound of birds chirping and the rustling of leaves as a cool breeze began to blow across her face. Standing there, she paused for the briefest of moments, wondering whether she was dreaming or awake, then tried to remind herself to tell Jack that his traveling spell actually worked and without another thought of the past or future, she stepped through the opening and disappeared from her quiet bedroom and the world she called home. A moment later, the guardian angel returned with a flaming sword in hand, then rushed to the magic portal, only to see it close before his eyes. In an instant he became fully visible, and Katie's room was suddenly ablaze with his heavenly light. The seven-foot angel grabbed the edge of Katie's door, searing the paint with his touch, and clenched his teeth in anger. The little girl had stepped out of this world and entered another, and now that she was gone, the powers of darkness had outsmarted him, and there was nothing he could do. The warrior of God stood in the earthly realm 
and slowly looked toward heaven. To follow the child would not only require the permission of God, it would call for another guardian that was far greater than he. With that, the angel sneered at the dark powers that were still at work and disappeared into the night. <laughs>